We'll do the square, give it like five, 10 minutes. If it's not receptive, we'll move on. All right. So here you go? Yeah, that will work. Um, except for we want to like, yeah, this works. No, that doesn't work. I'm just trying to think of like foot traffic. Um, okay, so what? Do we want to go here even though there's like guy? I feel like, I mean, yeah, so who cares? Okay, then let's, let's do it. Hey, I'm from the Pirate Party. You have a quick second? Uh, we just need a signature. Hey guys, I'm from, my name's Travis. I'm from the Pirate Party. You got a quick second? We're, I'm going to cross the street over here. Hey ma'am, you're tired of politics, right? Left, right, conservatives, liberals, no? You guys look like you're tired of the status quo. Left, right, conservatives, ah. Hey man, you're tired of politics, right? You probably don't even vote, eh? I'm from the Pirate Party of Canada. Uh, the Pirate Party of Canada, we focus, Pirate Party. We focus on civil liberties and we empowerment. You wanna take a quick second to hear, about, hear me out? Okay, you have a great day. I today, sir, as a Canadian, believe genuinely in what I am doing, I believe it is right for Canada. I believe that in my own modest way, I am nation building. À 22h20, heure de l'Est, Radio-Canada prévoit, si la tendance du vote se maintient, que l'option du non. Who needs special powers? The politicians. They're the ones who want special powers naturally, because they're in the power game. Canadians can now turn the page on the uncertainties and repeat elections of the past seven years and focus on building a great future for all of us. My name is Jean-Serge Bédisson. I'm with the Libertarian Party of Canada. Miguel Figueroa, and I'm the leader of the Communist Party of Canada. I'm John the Engineer Termel, and I first ran in politics in 1979. I'm Rod Taylor. I'm the deputy leader of the Christian Heritage Party of Canada. I am uh, the leader of Bridge Party, which is Canada's newest party. My name is John Akpata. I'm a member of the Marijuana Party of Canada. Hey guys, my name's Tim. I'm from Fort Mac, the heart of Mordor. It wasn't until I realized that, that all my beliefs were an emergent property of, of where I grew up. They weren't rationally derived. Uh, that I started kind of questioning. Libertarianism is the philosophy of the individual. It's about creating market incentives for individuals to function within society with the very minimal use of force. It was actually about the same time that I lost my childhood faith, that I lost my childhood statism, I guess you could say, belief in government. The way I see it, it's about economic freedom, uh, it's reduced taxes, fiscal responsibility. From a libertarian perspective, the only role of a government is courts, police, and military. I believe even it was uh, Pierre Trudeau said that the government does not have a place in the country's bedroom. If my wallet's in there too, I don't see how that's anyone's business. We think that we need a fundamentally different type of social system where uh, working people own the resources of our country. Uh, and can develop the, the, the main uh, industries and, and services without the capitalists. Unity can stop the Tory cuts, which are targeting all social services, and that's why we march. The goal of the party is in the first place to increase and to develop the class consciousness of the working people. Our contingent, namely the Communist Party of Canada and the Young Communist League, is immersed in this of the people. I started running underground blackjack games and getting busted. I just kept going and going and going. I got tired of being busted. I ran for parliament to legalize gambling. How come my casino chips don't inflate? And how come the government's coins do? It's the same hardware. Therefore, inflation must be a software problem. So I joined the social credit party with my grandfather and I wanted the uh, Bank of Canada to be interest-free. But there were some people who wanted to change it from 0% to 6%. Well, that's not very social credit, having to pay interest, 6%, somebody gets knocked out. I want social, no percent. I didn't have any choice, did I? I had to run on my own as an independent. The Canadian Constitution, the preamble to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, begins with this statement. 
Canada is founded on principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law. We have a constitution that, that's set before us. We're convinced that the constitution is based on the biblical values that have been taught from the scriptures. If there was a move at some point to change those principles, we would actually need to discontinue as a party and start up a new party. And the party formed when I was about five years old and my parents became members right away. We had a conservative government and yet nothing was happening. People that were thinking that after Trudeau things would turn around, it wasn't happening. The Christian Heritage Party makes its policy to reflect the ethical standard that's found in the Holy Bible. Our policy is that we don't uh, have any exceptions for uh, abortion in any case, we don't believe in it. And of course, we're the only federal party that stands for the traditional definition of marriage between one man and one woman until death. We got our registration the eve of Canada Day uh, this year. So we're pretty, we're still, we still have the placenta all over us. Here you see before you today, both the founder of the Bridge Party and its only candidate. I consider the Bridge Party the first non-partisan party in Canada for sure, but maybe in the entire world. I mean, I don't know that that anybody got their mind around this oxymoronic thing. You know, you're a party, but you're nonpartisan. The Marijuana Party, we're unified by one common idea, and that statement is cannabis should not be criminalized. That's it. The ideal Marijuana Party would have one candidate in every riding being very vocal, very intelligent, Excuse me, ma'am. You care to sign a nomination form for the Marijuana Party Canada's federal election? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. Because I don't. All right, I'll, I'm sorry about you. Have a good day. Sorry about you. Good day, sir. Do you care to sign a nomination form for the Marijuana Party's federal election? Oh, I'm okay. Thanks, sir. Take care. Have a good day. I'm seeking signatures for a nomination for the Marijuana Party Canada's federal election. My oh, name's Terry call. Park. Yeah, I'm Would the uh, like candidate. Fly? Yeah. Go ahead. I'll okay, sign. I'll sign it. <laughs> Anybody here like to vote marijuana in the next federal election? I'm Terry Park. I'm trying to get signatures for the uh, federal election. Okay, I'll get them. Care to vote marijuana in the federal election, sir? No, I'll get them. Anybody here care to wish to vote marijuana in the federal election? Excuse me, sir. Oh, he's busy. Excuse me, ma'am. My name is Terry Parker. If I can get 150 signatures, I'd get my name on the ballot so you can vote marijuana if you wish to do so. It's not public opinion that we need to sway. It's the opinion of the members of parliament because they're not changing the law to reflect what the citizenship wants. Voters want inspiration. They want hope. They want to be told that their vote's going to make a difference, even against the current perverse, dreadful, first-past-the-post system that we must replace with proportional representation. Every vote matters. Every vote in every riding matters. One of the functions of our system is you just need one more vote than the second place person. And what that means is if it's a very competitive race, then the second place finisher gets nothing. Well, of course, first past the post doesn't work as well for small parties. We haven't elected any members, none of us. Um, well, the Green Party, I guess, did, but then they immediately declared themselves a big party. For a whole number of reasons, it's very difficult for any small party to break through. And this uh, relates to the electoral system that we have in this country, the first-past-the-post system. I think there's a, a bit of a, an unstated rule among the smaller parties that you don't quibble about the system of proportional representation. You just try to get the idea across that it would be better for Canada. Proportional representation would ensure we have minority governments almost all the time. And I think that leads to considerable instability in our government and its ability to make firm decisions and carry them out. I would see the proportional representation, while it might balance interest towards particular ideas or ideologies, uh, it would actually diminish what we have right now, which is regional representation. I think what PR countries do is ensure there's a more robust discussion of different alternatives. And I think that allows for greater policy innovation and allows for, quite frankly, um, interesting things. Our party was the very first party in this country to call for proportional representation. And now, if you look at polls, almost 50% of the Canadian people feel that some sort of proportional representation system would be superior. If we switch to a, 
constant minority situation, then there's going to have to be deals on all kinds of different bills in the course of the government's life. The opposition says, no, we won't vote for any tax increases, we won't vote for any cuts, we've got to maintain things the way they are, you won't get it. The big parties who have benefited from that system have a vested interest in not changing it. Electoral reform is needed in Parliament, but the largest electoral reform that has to happen is the public needs to vote. I've talked to so many people that I know. I ask them, are you voting in this election? And they're like, voting? Why would I do that? You know, my dad doesn't do that. You know, that's all a bunch of BS. The public does not engage with politics very well because the politicians are perceived as, you know, horrible liars and, and tax money grabbers that are not following the will of the people. One of the things that's extraordinary about what happens when a Green Party candidate has a chance of winning is that voter turnout goes way up. It goes way up. If even half the people who chose not to vote federally in 2011, if even half, probably even a quarter, had actually gotten out and voted, a majority conservative government would not have been possible with a minority of public support. The fact that we have such a low voter turnout in Canada is sad and astonishing, really. It's a country that's definitely worth doing something for. And why in the world can we not be bothered to vote in elections? I even asked the chief electoral officer, I said, is there a minimum that's required for the election to be legal? Like, can the chief electoral officer say not enough people voted so it's not a legitimate election and we kind of need to go to the United Nations for help or something like that? And he's like, no, there's no minimum. If we could get 60% voter turnout in a writing, that's good. Like, really good. It doesn't normally happen. By-elections, it's astonishingly low. Some people have a maybe somewhat jaded outlook saying that, oh, you know, I can vote for this party or that party and it's rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. It doesn't mean anything. If you look at, you know, the major parties in both North American countries, it's that's a, not an unreasonable statement. Every big political party has disappointed in some way or another. The main federal political parties are completely out of touch with what regular people want. It's very homogeneous. It's pretty much rich, powerful, white men. And they almost exclusively operate to the exclusion of everybody else. You cannot hear anything from any party other than the ones that are allowed to have been heard all year. When you're in Parliament, you're in a bit of a bubble, I guess. You sort of look at what's there and how you can improve it. But when you're outside and you're looking at Parliament, you see things differently. These parties are, are viewed as as fringe parties. I think Elections Canada might be the only government-related body in Ottawa with any bureaucrats that actually pay attention to these parties. Oh, the photocopies are in here. Do you have photocopy service, man? Uh, yeah. this closer to pharmacy. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear. Thank you. Hi. I just put a buck twenty-five in. No, I just want this way. I put it, or you got to put it this way. Um. I believe you have to put it this way. This way? Yeah. How does it come out? Oh, I see. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. One side of the coin of politics, a very big side of the coin, is that it can be dull and boring and tedious. At some point, you know, the dull meter will, will actually be a canary in the coal mine, and you better be paying attention to that. With the group, we'll uh, choose a scrutineer, so a person who will take responsibility for counting the ballots. I see Dallas over here volunteering to be scrutineer. Okay, so fantastic. So I'd like to 
put a motion on the floor that Dallas be appointed as the scrutineer, so I will move that motion. Anyone second? Derek, he just happens to be closest to my eye here. I saw a lot of hands, but Derek seconds. I don't think we need any discussion. All in favor? Opposed? All right, it's unanimous. After the Second World War, I think was probably the height of uh, membership and support. Then came the Cold War, and it had a chilling effect. People were being harassed at their jobs, their children were being harassed in school because they were the sons and daughters of communists. We lived in the former Soviet Union, so I had that ingrained in me how those kinds of systems, those collectivist systems, are inherently corrupt and I would go as far as to say evil. I came to Canada in 1980. Communism was still running full force at that point. And when people ask what is my political background, what was I before I was a libertarian, my answer was very straightforward and very simple, I was a staunch anti-communist. Then of course we had another setback, which was of course the overturning of socialism in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Uh, there was all this propaganda that Marxism is dead, socialism is dead, uh, we've reached the end of history. I saw the lives of my family, my grandparents, my parents destroyed by the system. I came out with this very deep felt opposition to it. I visited uh, the Soviet Union, Moscow, Leningrad, and uh, I'll tell you something, there, there were all these positive things, universal child care, free education, free health care, transit systems were incredible. When I crossed the border and I was out of the sight of the border guards, I just got off my bike and I just lay down in the, in the, in the, in the grass saying, never again, I'm out. Obviously there were problems with respect to democratic expression. One of the most uh, serious failings and weaknesses of the first wave of socialism was that they placed too much emphasis on public ownership, but not sufficiently uh, enough emphasis on the importance of developing socialist uh, democracy. In the absence of that, it, um, it had many dire consequences. One of the, uh, the things that still drives me uh, today is this creeping feeling that uh, what I ran away from is slowly coming back on me. Right from the very beginning, if you're going to try and engage the media or engage people who don't believe the same way you do, it's not about you. It has to be about them. Problem is, we're speaking two different languages. Your language is faith-based. Their language is fact-based. You might think there's no difference there, but they do. We are confused because one person is blowing, one person is killing, and then all of a sudden you see your neighbor saying, oh, no, 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 that's not, they're not Muslim, they're not Islamic. There are only two people. One is a Muslim, one is a non-Muslim. There is no moderate Muslim and extremist. That's it. I fought the curriculum back as far as 2001 when they were introducing anal and oral sex. So what they're introducing now is going to be in grade three, they'll be talking about uh, they'll call it same-sex marriage. I call it depraved thinking. And I'm going to ask you this question. When is the church going to wake up? Yeah. And that's the question I'm asking. But I'm done for now because it's your time. Are you asking me? Or no, I'm asking everybody? us all. When are we going to wake up? When Don't are we going to kind of come out of the slumber and start standing up? Can I share saying, this? Because no. we, we that I'm are not. more active on these issues, there's a, t there's a risk for us. And I want to just state this. I know the church should be doing far more. Brothers and sisters in the Christian Heritage Party, we have been kept from our purposes for 28 years. We have men and women, brothers and sisters, who share the name of Christian, and yet they have weakened the hands and shaken the confidence and undermined the faith of some of our CHP members. I'm talking about those outside the party who have refused to join us. And it has hurt to see them go. It has hurt to hear them say, I just don't think the CHP is ever gonna get in. When other parties have morphed and changed their spots and changed their platforms to accommodate the media-driven drivel and the left-wing lunacy of our times, the CHP has stood firm. There was a time when you had to have a minimum of 50 candidates. The CHP, we had I think 49 or 48 candidates and we lost our registered status. But the good old Communist Party was in the same category and they fought it in court and they won. The conservative government of the day, the Mulroney government, 
um, passed a number of changes to the Canada Elections Act. What they did essentially was to make it much more difficult for small parties to register and then if parties failed to field 50 candidates in an election, they were basically put out of business. We deregistered on our own before the government did it to us because it allowed us the capacity to dissolve or dispose of our assets. We protested that. We thought it was unconstitutional, very extremely draconian. Uh, and we started a court case, um, which um, dragged on and on, as, as court cases often do. You actually don't learn about the system until you're in it until you're actually trying to do something and you really learn if you try to change it. It went to the Supreme Court of Canada and that was heard in 2002 and the final judgment came down in 2003. It was uh, really quite uh, a tremendous victory for all small parties. Here's one where we take our hats off to the Communist Party even though we have vast disagreements on many other areas. If a fringe party wants to become a mainstream party, they have to do the work that's necessary. And one of those things is to have a comprehensive platform. If you're going to be a libertarian or a communist, it's not enough to simply state that there should be no government or it should only be government. You have to have policies on the major issues of the day. I don't come from, and communists in Canada don't come from a place of wanting to get elected. We come from a place of wanting to change Canada. So if that's your first and foremost goal, then it's going to be a tough slog. If you're a small fringe party uh, or a marginal party, then uh, it's a struggle all the way down. As a member of the Marijuana Party, I've never received any payment. I've never received any remuneration. I've never received any campaign donations. When I register as a candidate and I get my elections package from Elections Canada, there's all these tax receipts and electoral district association paperwork. I don't even touch it. We don't get any funding from corporations, obviously. We don't get any government funding. We don't get any union funding. One of the things that I did for the party was to analyze what it is that's getting people elected. What is associated with a successful campaign? And uh, far and away, it, it's the funds that go into the campaign. Political parties require significant funds to run an election campaign. And as the per vote subsidy is eliminated, they'll require and rely on the tax credits of direct contributions. We're living on the cheerful donations of our membership and that does make it challenging. If you're looking to make a lot of money, don't become a communist. Virtually all of our financial resources come from our, our membership and our supporters. So as a result of that, we have a very small staff and we pay terrible wages. I am one of the four paid staff for the Christian Heritage Party. Everything else that we get done is done by volunteers. I am uh, full-time when the party can afford to pay me, and sometimes I get laid off and I have to look for other work. Our income is 100% donations. We do not receive a penny from uh, the federal government, and we don't mind that. We only mind that the Conservatives got 10 million, the Greens got 1.8 million. These big parties are now in the House of Commons. They have their income stream guaranteed, and they've pulled up the drawbridge because they don't want uh, the competition there. The larger parties have a much better and well-established machine to do fundraising. And the Conservative Party boasts that the only day they take off is Christmas Day for fundraising. Smaller parties don't have that luxury. When I was young and I was first getting interested in, in left-wing politics, I thought, well, maybe I should join the, the Liberal Party and rise up through the ranks and become the leader of the party and then one day I could call a press conference and announce that the, the party was changing its position and advocating socialism, you know, and so on. Well, it was a, almost a childhood fantasy. There is some talk about, okay, you might be a political rising star. Have you considered maybe joining the Conservative Party? Have you considered the Wild Rose Party? You can sense that they feel a little bit threatened by my message because I'm getting some popularity and they're trying to woo me a little bit. I was running the 2007 provincial election. When I went to the first all candidates meeting, I was a little nervous. I started most of these debates and most of these introductions with a joke. The joke goes like this. It says that two uh, friends meet from Venteslavsky shortly after the elections, and one asks the other, so who did you vote for? And the friend says, ah, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed to say, but I was voting communist. And the other one said, me too, but which party? I think it's almost impossible for me to join a federal political party that aligns with my values, because the ruling parties 
rule through a lot of deception and a lot of misinformation. This is the thing that set the tone for me as a libertarian talking about all of these mainstream parties, the, uh, the conservatives, the liberals, the NDP. From my perspective, they are all communists. An old friend of mine in the NDP was giving me a ride home from a meeting and he stopped the car and he said, I know you're frustrated and I think you should just consider joining the Communist Party. But keep in mind two things. Uh, they're a very small party and you'll have to help fund it. <laughs> and he was right on both counts. One of the curiosities of our electoral system is that if you have a very strong, charismatic leader like Elizabeth May, you're able to be successful. In 2011, in the riding of Saanich Gulf Islands, uh, Elizabeth May, the leader of the Green Party, ran uh, in the federal election and she won a seat. The Green Party had its leader and an elected representative in Parliament, but also it was significant because it had proven wrong the naysayers. I'm actually glad that Elizabeth May had the opportunity to uh, break the paradigm and show that a leader of a small party can get elected. All the volunteers they had, all the money they had, was put into making sure that Elizabeth May got elected. It, it was a solidly important strategy to do what they did because that legitimized us as a national party. We think it would be helpful for the, for the Green Party not to, to forget the, the long, I don't know, 20 years or so where they were a very small party and not, not getting into the debates, and they still struggle. Hello and welcome to The Local Campaign. I'm Roger Peterson from City News. On October 19th, Canada will elect the 42nd Parliament for the next hour. You'll hear from the candidates of University Rosedale. After a leadership debate, people are like, well, uh, so-and-so was very composed and like wore this color tie and like delivered this message confidently. We need to expand the, the public sector in these areas, create good unionized jobs uh, through infrastructure spending. And uh, so I wish the major parties would talk more about how and where the, the infrastructure spending is going. Well, what did they say? What were their policies? What will it mean for Canada? Like, come on, like, let's, let's talk politics instead of people's personality. The problems that we're talking about, some of them are very, very serious, you know, and there's just no forum for that. Well, it's a bit sad that we all have to debate this kind of stuff instead of having actual, an actual conversation. And that, in my view, is, the, is what the party system is all about. It forces one person against another. There's a lot of good ideas around this table even, you know, not to talk about the, 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 the whole national uh, debate. There are Christians who are serving as MPs within the Conservative Party. They will even say that they are not able to uh, voice their perspective even within the caucus because they have been silenced for that. The Green Party, the NDP, the Liberals and the Conservatives do not represent any real alternative. If you go down the checklist of what it is they're saying and how they actually behave in government, they're all the same. You don't have a choice. In spite of the fact that there are very good people in the Conservative Party and, for that matter, there are some in the NDP and Liberal too, not as many, but there are some good Christian people that are serving in those parties, their influence is minimal. I got into politics because of Pierre Trudeau. Not because I admired him, but he caused me to get into politics because of the bad decisions he was making. And I see Justin making worse decisions than his dad. I think like lots of Canadians, there was a point at which Stephen Harper's uh, management style started grading on me. In the last few years, I have thought to myself, Stephen Harper is the worst prime minister we have ever had. Half the progressive community, put that way, is hysterical, you know, and get rid of Harper, you know, anybody but Harper. And if you ask them whether they're prepared to bring in, say, the Communist Party, instead of Harper. When you say anyone, do you mean anyone? Give it a shot, vote for pot. Get off your ass, vote for grass.
So does everybody understand the, the plan, the procedure? You, you indicate, you can check, mark an X. As long as Dallas can figure it out, it's cool. So a check mark would be good, an X would be okay. You're positively indicating that you're casting a vote for that person. You could mark beside it. He's gonna have to look at this and try to determine your intent. So if your intent is to vote for somebody, a check is a pretty good idea. An X would do okay as well. A yes would be fine. You don't have to say no if you don't want to vote for somebody. Just don't vote for them. A few moments ago, I met with His Excellency the Governor General, and he has agreed to my request that Parliament be dissolved. In accordance with our commitment to a fixed election date, the next general election will be held as prescribed by law. We've got lawn signs, and, and this is a, a fairly new thing for us to be campaigning with lawn signs. It's about um, advertising the party, that we are around, we have candidates, uh, we have a candidate in this riding, and you should think about it. I was trying to get those out there who are not voting this year, that's so my main focus. Young people, those are just apathetic or lethargic. <laughs> you got your vote, Mom? Yay! Hey, hey, yo, ho, Steve Harvey's got to go, vote marijuana. Oh, look out your vote, dear. It's great for all timers, you know that, eh? Get out of your ass, let's vote for grass. Get a shot, Rover Park, Park Park, Park, the Maryland yeah, Party of Canada. Thanks a lot, man. appreciate it, man. Want a poster, about. boss? Poster? Yeah. yeah I'll take a poster, man. There we go, thank you, sir. Go ahead. Get everybody out to vote this year. Let's get 100% voting this year. Everybody out there this year. Oh, to the oh, people. Boss? Have a good day. The kind one spirit. Don't no, forget, Park Park, Park, though. Hey, yo! Steve Harper's got to go! We got a shot, Barbara Paul! Get out of your ass! Vote for the grass! Hey, oh, Steve Harper's got to go! We got a shot, Barbara Paul! Let's get out of your ass! Vote for the grass! Hey, oh, Prohibition's got to go! Let's be like Colorado! This is make up as go along, right? <laughs> Look, got your vote, dear? Oh. You gonna vote marijuana this year, maybe? Ends oh. cancer in Canada? Oh. I hope so. Oh. Yeah, we're, we're trying to legalize marijuana in Canada. Oh. Okay? Yeah, <laughs> I wish I could speak to Ben. <laughs> I've had a, a big problem when it comes to my epilepsy, and a bigger problem when it comes to the cure for epilepsy, which is marijuana. So I'm facing a lot of discrimination. Let's end this stigma. And uh, and this and this uh, uh, this uh, harm upon the people when it comes to prohibition. That's all it is. The crime itself. So, are there any other questions before we continue with the voting? All right. Hearing none. So, I would invite you all to vote and just fold your page in half when you voted and give it to Dallas. Dallas, once you have 18 sheets, if you want to have an observer to help you out so you can help him and just make sure he's not doing anything funny. Just write zero. I mean, it's not. I'm not. Can you just put zero so that I know that there's no here? Because there was. You have no votes for this person here, I believe. No. Not. In, yeah. yeah in that one. I have the results as reported to me by Dallas. For leader, Tim Moan, 18 votes. Golok Boudet, zero votes. Tim Moan is elected leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada. Thanks, buddy. Um, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. 
2015 is right around the corner, and you know, if I'm going to be prime minister, we kind of got some work to do, right? <laughs> I want to get a picture today in front of the parliament building because I think we need to establish in the minds of Canadians this image that a libertarian can be prime minister. My crystal ball is as cloudy as the next person's, so I'm not going to make any predictions in terms of how the overall vote will go. certainly hope that it results in a new government and sees the defeat of the Harper Tories, but we will see. I got the good days out there and a lot of positive reaction to people. I'll go get them and all that stuff. And, uh, it was uh, not a bad experience, pretty good. Hopefully this year they might uh, consider a real cure for cancer and put me in. We face the same obstacles that we've historically faced, and that is that it's very difficult for small parties to, to kind of break through. You know, people feel that, well, they like our platform, they like what we have to say, and so on, but they're concerned about voting for us because they think it would be wasting their vote. Oh, no big lineup this morning. That's good. Was it busy early? Is that right, eh? Before work or something like that. Was there? Well, we timed it. We timed it well then. That elderly woman that was sitting down outside said, "Are you Mr. Oliphant?" I said, "No." I said, "Oh, you look like his picture." Quite the thing going for yourself, tell you the truth, but I hope all my endeavors pay off. I hope the people of Park Light Park uh, realize it's a serious change. Um, that would be quite uh, remarkable if we can get a marijuana seat in the House, and uh, hopefully by the next election, which I imagine will be quite shortly, uh, we can formulate some sort of full House majority. Uh, based on the uh, information that we've seen, the analysis of the numbers coming in from all these different ridings, What's well, looked clear for some time now, uh, the Liberal government of, uh, I almost said Pierre Trudeau, uh, Justin Trudeau uh, will be a majority government tonight. The Liberals attaining the majority status, they're well above the crowd. I think we got about 128 votes, uh, which I, I guess I didn't realize that I had that many friends. We didn't do as well as we would have liked to, I guess, in terms of um, number of votes, probably. We got 3% of the vote, which was not great. I think that we can say that uh, of all of the parties that were running, uh, Libertarians had the largest relative gain. This election was driven by a fear slash fatigue Discussed. I don't know what the words are with the Conservatives' approach to, to governing. I think it's very important and could be described as a victory that um, the Harper government was defeated and that there's a new government in place. I don't think that they will treat things as sophisticatedly as things have to be treated. I just don't see the Liberals falling through their promise to legalize like they've done in the previous elections. The biggest ray of hope for us, I suppose, is electoral reform. It could give us a, an opportunity to um, win a seat, which would be a, you know, a major step forward. Hopefully next federal election that uh, we can get some sort of a marijuana party majority, have more accountability. I think we've seen sort of the lowest and I think we're, we're moving upwards at this point. I think that there is a good chance that, uh, that Libertarians will break the barriers within the next 15, 20 years. There are those who are cynical who say, well, nothing will ever change. The rich will always be rich and they'll get richer and we'll eke out an existence and then we'll die and then the same thing or worse will befall our, our children or our grandchildren. But I think that uh, 
uh, apart from those uh, people who are, are tied up in cynicism, that there's a lot of people who really would like to see an alternative. And when they hear the slogan, another world is possible, they really do genuinely hope that another world is possible. I knew that my chances are zilch, but that was not the point of running. The point of running is to make the voice heard. I do think that uh, you know when you when you put the picture together, you do see that there's a um, there is a struggle that's moving forward, um, and it's moving forward unevenly. That's for sure, but it is moving forward. It's been an education. It really has. You know, I mean, uh, I've learned more about Canadian politics doing it than I ever could from any book. Someone who is successful is, is, is one who, who believes what, the, what they're doing is the right thing to do and regardless of the consequences you keep plugging ahead and if you can continue to move ahead with what you believe is right then you are successful. You have to look at it in terms of members, people that you've changed, people that you've influenced and once you do that then you see progress, you see results and you can come out of an election even with fewer votes than you thought, but still be encouraged by the people that are now solidly on side with you. Coming from a place where you, you want to change the world, you see something really wrong or systemically wrong, once you're there, it's like, well, what's the solution? Is to get organized. Get active in a political party, work in the party, uh, work for people who are running, get to know them, and they're more likely to be supportive of you when you need the help. On the ballot, it's in alphabetical order, so my name was right on top. They spelled my name correctly, they had marijuana party, and I looked at it and I'm like, wow, I'm gonna vote for myself. And I put the little X beside my name and it had a very profound impact on my consciousness. I realized I'm an empowered person. I have all the rights and privileges and powers of any other citizen in Canada. I did the exact same paperwork and went through the exact same process as the Prime Minister. Everybody has to do liberals, all, any political group. Yeah, has to. I have done this before, but for the liberal guy. But I am a equal opportunity. See what here. I'm saying? You got it. Even though it's a small party and, and that has some frustrations to it, it really is, uh, I think, an important political voice in the Canadian landscape. I think real change comes from bottom-up communities. I think real change comes from people functioning on a small scale, starting businesses, supporting each other. Guinness World Records uh, put me in the book for running in 41 elections, most elections contested. It's not about me at all. It, it's about something that is much bigger. And this is, you know, something that we feel is necessary for, for our, the kids' future, for our grandkids. It's, it's for the future of the world. I might be completely out of my mind, but I, I, I really believe that this party is going to be the next big thing. So oh.